Woo, good morning, Northside. Welcome to 2023. We've got a few things planned for you, as you can see, and we're excited for 2023. I'm John Presco. I'm the small group minister here, and it is an honor to be here with you. Uh, before we get started in the message this morning, I just want to say thank you for being a church that gives. Our one less gift, you guys gave over $33,000. Let's give praise to the Lord for that. Amen. It's going to help Victory Mission and some benevolence ministry, and we praise the Lord for that. You guys also did an incredible job with the angel tree that was out in the lobbies. You grabbed those angels off there to bring gifts for kids who had a parent that was incarcerated. I want to show you a couple of pictures. We had a little ceremony here where we, they were able to open gifts. You can see the incredible looks on their face. They had dinner together. They had some worship. They heard the Christmas story. And we're so thankful that they had a great Christmas. And it was because of you and your generosity. So thank you so much for that. I hope you had a great Christmas just like those kids. Everybody have a good Christmas? Pretty good? Okay, I want you to think of your favorite Christmas gift, and I want to hear it. You ready? You got your favorite Christmas gift? I'm going to count to three, and I want to hear it. Everybody ready? You got it? Here we go. One, two, three. Okay, I heard a lot of great things. We must have had a great Christmas. I think I might have heard Jesus out there, whether it was your first Christmas with Jesus or one of many. Um, I hope you had a great Christmas. Our family had a great Christmas. We uh, love to celebrate and do some traditional things. And one of those is we used to, when the kids were little, we'd bake a happy birthday cake, right? It's Jesus' birthday. And we'd put a candle in there and we'd all blow it out. Now we truly believe, just as the rivers of heaven flow with Dr. Pepper, that Jesus loves cinnamon rolls more than cake. And so we have cinnamon rolls on Christmas morning. We stick a candle in the Christmas, in the cinnamon roll, and we sing happy birthday to Jesus around a cinnamon roll. Even our older kids did that. And then oftentimes we will read the story out of Luke 2, but this year we did something different, and we watched The Shepherd by, by uh, Dallas Jenkins, uh, The Chosen, the very first episode that he ever made, and it's Luke 2 that just played out from the view of the shepherds as Jesus was born, and we watched that together as a family. And then we opened gifts, like most of us always do, and we had a great Christmas together, and I hope you had some joy together receiving gifts, giving gifts, hearing about the Christmas story together with your family But here's what I notice can happen, because we all get stuff, right? We get stuff at Christmas, every one of us, and we have a great time together. But if we lose our focus, our focus going into the new year can be more about our stuff than remembering about Jesus. And if we get our eyes on Jesus, off of Jesus, and it's more on our stuff, it just starts to bring stress, and anxiety. I know it does to me, and I'm assuming maybe it does to you at times. Some of you are already thinking, teenagers in the room, about when I go back to school and everybody starts talking about what gifts they got and comparing and how it compares to everybody else. Some of you are thinking about, I got to pay for Christmas now. Oh my goodness. Or what's next year going to look like? And and we just start to stress when we get our priorities off. Today, we're going to start a two-part series talking about flow. What flows in? today, and then next week, Wayne's going to talk about as things flow out. And this series should touch every one of us because we all have things that flow in, right? Our stuff or our finances for a lot of us as adults, and even some of you teenagers, as you start to have finances come into your life. And it's important that we understand this because we need to understand, and this is the gist of the whole message, is who the owner is. That we as believers are stewards And that God is the owner, not us. And we get when we get that backwards, it's going to cause a lot of problems in our life. Now, John, what is a steward? I'm glad you asked that question. A steward, here's the definition I have for a steward. It's an overseer of the property of another. The overseer of the property of another. Now, some of you may be saying, well, I don't don't oversee anything but my own property, so I'm not really a steward. Well, Maybe you are. I love the way Mark Moore says it, the writer of Core 52 and recently Quest 52. He says this, life does not consist of or stem from what we have, but from our relationship with God. You see, God wants everything to be about a relationship with him. And that includes our stuff, our finances, the things that flow into our lives. And he wants to see them. He wants us to see them in a godly way. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get these things wrong. 
I just do. I've not been great at this all of my life. I struggle with it. I think that's why I'm preaching this sermon, because I needed to hear it. Uh, just a couple of months ago, I was getting on to Becca about cleaning her room, cleaning her bathroom. She's like, but dad, it's my room. I'm the only one in my room. What do I need to clean it for? I don't know if you've ever heard that from one of your kids or you've said it yourself. I probably said it. And I'm the only one that uses my bathroom. Why does, I'm, it is my house. I pay for, you're going to do your chores and do the things. See what I said? It's my house. Your mom and dad make the money. We pay for this house. You go clean the parts that are yours. Even I messed that up. The truth is, whose house is it? God wants us to say it is his. We are just the steward, right? We just are the overseer of the property of what God has blessed us with. Whether it's our house or our car or our phones or our bank accounts or the gifts we got for Christmas, they're not ours. They are a blessing that God has given to us so that we can steward it well. You see, it all belongs to God. Can you say that with me? It all belongs to God. Now, come on, you did okay, but you did better with Corey. Let's say it together. Let's mean it this time. Are you ready? It all belongs to God. Do we believe that? Do we live that? That's what I'm trying to do better. Because if we're not totally sure about that, God has some verses to remind us that everything is his. In Psalm chapter 24, verse 1, he says this, The earth is the Lord's, and some of the things in it. No, everything in it. He even says the world and all of its people belong to him. You and I belong to him. Everything in the world I love. In Psalm chapter 50, verses 10 through 12, it says, For every animal in the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains and the creatures of the field are mine. Here's my favorite verse. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world and everything in it is mine. Don't you love it? I get hungry for a cheeseburger. I have to go to Brahms. God just says, I got the cattle on a thousand hills. I'll just make me a cheeseburger. I've got the chickens everywhere. I'll make me some fried chicken. I'm not going to ask you if I'm hungry. Church, if we don't understand this principle that everything is God's, we're going to struggle with money all of our lives. Think about it this way. Any of you ever been a renter? Maybe you've rented a house, or maybe you've rented a car, or maybe you've got a VRBO or an Airbnb. You've used somebody else's stuff. When something breaks, you don't fix it, right? You call the landlord, Think about that word, the land Lord, the Lord of the land. See, if God owns it all and it's all his, he's the one that's going to fix it. We don't have to carry the stress of that. When we own something ourselves, we carry all kinds of stress and anxiety for that because we have control of it and we have to fix it. Like I said, this has been a struggle with me at times. I've struggled with the budget. I've struggled at times with living within my means. I struggled when we first moved here. In 2009, we moved here, and right on the uh, tails of 2008, we could not sell our house in Oklahoma. I don't understand it was in the metropolis of Nowata, Oklahoma. I know you've all heard of that. It's a big town of 3,000 where the oil boom hit and left, and nobody wants to live there, apparently. We couldn't sell our house, and we struggled for a couple of years. And, and the other thing is, we moved here in 2009 with two kids, teenagers, and then all of a sudden... Here comes Becca. We had a child, another baby. And so we were having to get diapers and we were having to take care of teenagers and we couldn't sell our house. And so we were struggling. And for two years, we tried to take care of it on our own. We'd have people move in and then we'd still show the house and try to sell it. And they hated that. So they didn't want to live there anymore back and forth. And finally, we just said, I give up. We give up. God, this is yours. We don't understand it. We don't know why it's sold. Has it sold? You called us here to Springfield, Missouri. This house is yours. And immediately somebody moved in and they've been there ever since. God blessed. Now, as soon as the cold hit a few weeks ago, they went to turn the heat on and guess what? No heat. Had somebody go over to look at it to repair it and they found out some things were stolen off the outside unit. And it caused some problems with some other things. I got a bill for $1,700 right before Christmas. And for just a moment, I was like, 
$1,700. And then I remembered this isn't my house. And I had plenty of money in my house savings account to take care of that bill. God blessed because I was a good steward of what he had given to us. See, when God owns it and you're a good steward, there's no stress to pay the bills because God will take care of it. Robert Morris, from his book, Beyond Blessed, says this, putting God first and recognizing that it all belongs to him liberates us all from fear of loss and insufficiency. It's a concept as the church, as believers, we have to get. We have to get that we can work for it. We can earn it. In fact, our name can be on the deed or on the title, but if you are a believer, then you really understand that it's not really ours, that everything is God's. doesn't matter if you paid for it. doesn't matter if you got it as a gift for Christmas or for your birthday or a celebration. Everything that you have is, come on, come on. Everything that you have is, we got to believe it. We got to just not say it in a sermon. We got to believe it and we've got to live it. And I'm right there with you. And God will bless. Let me tell you a little story. Because I believe that when we really believe this, we really believe that he's the owner, then when he tells you to give something away, it's no big deal. Because it's not ours in the first place. And I truly believe that oftentimes God has a bigger blessing waiting for us if we will just let go and listen to God and do as he tells us. Wayne told the story a few months ago, but I want to tell it again. We take annual trips in March to Mexico, and we go work with Crossroads Missions in Piedras Negras. And a couple of years ago, about three years ago, Venezuela was a mess, and their people were leaving in droves and coming to seek asylum in America. Most of them came. Some of them got across. Uh, and legally, and America had worked all that out with them, some of them most of them came hoping to be there, and it take about two months. And then guess what happened? COVID hit the world. We met a lot of Venezuelans, and one of the families that we met were Adonai and Nileska. I connected with Adonai right away because Adonai was six foot four, and he could talk English, and he loved to play basketball. So we played some basketball. He had a family of four kids, and they were there 22 months instead of two, struggling, had used all their savings. And when we went back a year later, they were still there. And as we left, God put them on my heart, and I couldn't take them off my heart. I couldn't stop thinking about them. Where were they going to go? Where were they going to get a job? How were they going to get around? They had nobody helping them, and they had very little funds. And so I started to go to work. At first, I started to go to work. I'm going to move them here to Springfield. God had other plans. With Zeb Myers, who was a minister at First Church in Owasso, and some other things that happened here, we went down and got them and moved them to Owasso, Oklahoma. And one of the things that Brent and I were doing at the time was we had an old Chrysler town and country, 200,000 plus miles. We were done with it. We were ready to get something new. We were planning for that and saving for that. And God said, instead of selling that car or trading it in, I want you to give it to this family. It holds seven and they have six in their family. So we did exactly that. There's a picture that you see of Brenda and I signing over the title to Adonai and Ileska. I know that they used it to do DoorDash and other things and making money with it. I, it would have been dead by now if we owned it. They're still using it because God is blessing their family. And all we have to do is surrender that to him and be good stewards. We have to get this down because it'll change your life when you understand that everything is God's. In the same way that people give and God blesses supernaturally, I truly believe that when you become a good steward, God blesses supernaturally. And it's not just about having a budget. There's a lot to do with that, having a budget and living within our means and all the numbers coming together, and then God wants to bless supernaturally. Don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about health and wealth, and if we just get all those things right, God's going to overwhelm you with wealth. I'm talking about being blessed to be a blessing, and anybody can do that. Teenagers can do that on an allowance. We can do that whether we're making $25,000 or we're making $250,000. And you know the truth is, God started this whole thing with stewardship. He put Adam and Eve in the garden that he created for them, and he said, I want you to tend to it. I want you to steward the garden. But he said one thing, didn't he? 
See that one tree? I don't want you to eat from that one tree. And I think now I understand what he was doing. He wanted them to walk by that tree daily and know that he was the owner. They were stewards. And then the serpent comes along. Satan comes along and tells them, oh, you can be more than stewards. You can be like God and you can be an owner. Just take from the tree. And we know what that brought. They no longer were able to be in the garden because God kicked them out. Why? Because they chose to take control. They chose to be their own gods and therefore it brought sin and pain. God wants us to understand that he is the owner. But I want to ask you today, are you a good steward? Are you being a blessing to others because you are a good steward and blessed? I believe that the reason Jesus talked about money so much was because he knew how it could get in the way of our relationship with him. And that we have this constant urge to take control in our own lives. I don't know about you, but I am a control freak. I love to be in control. I want to be in control of everything. I get reminded often, you don't have to be in control, honey. You can imagine who tells me that. There's only one person that calls me honey. And I need to hear that because it's something I struggle with. I want to be the owner. I want to be in control. Now, Jesus loves to speak to us to our hearts. He loves to tell stories. And in Luke chapter 12, he's going to tell one of those, those stories. He tells a parable, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So I want us to look in Luke chapter 12. You got your Bibles or your device. Let's look at this parable that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 12, verse 16. This is going to help us see and understand a little bit about what he's talking about when it comes to being an owner and being a steward. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. And he told them a parable saying this. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. Now that sounds like a great problem to have, right? God is blessed and you're overwhelmed with abundance and he's got to find somewhere else to store his crops. But if you can read into it, his heart is changing. He's got a heart problem. And he starts to do what I often do, and he comes up with his own plan. In verse 18, he says this, I will do this. I will tear down my barns. I will build larger ones, and there I will store my grain and my goods. Now, let's be honest. We've all done this before, right? You're like, wait, John, I don't have a barn. I mean, I personally don't have a barn. I've not built bigger barns. But we have all upgraded Say the word upgrade. Anybody done it? Anybody do it for Christmas? I did it. Upgraded in a new pair of hey dudes. You know, we all got something we've upgraded in, right? <clears throat> we all had an upgrade probably over Christmas. I want to show you a few pictures here. Uh, my Becca has upgraded. She started with wired earphones. She hated them. She was always breaking them. I never could understand why they didn't last forever, but they were cheap, so I liked them. So then we upgraded her to those, exactly that, that pair right there, those white iHome ear pods. And I thought, she'll love those. She hated the little plastic piece. We wanted to see if she could be trusted and not lose them. She never lost them. We still have them. And then finally Christmas, she got, what do they call them? AirPods? She got some AirPods for Christmas. She loves them. She got them in... All the time, we're telling them all the time, telling her, take them out, listen to us. But she was blessed. She upgraded for Christmas. Maybe you've upgraded with a new iPad. I know for our kids, we start, they started with the Amazon Fire Pad because it was nice, it was cheap, it got them onto some of the things they wanted. And then they start taking moms and want to use mom's up pad, iPad, and then finally they get a new one. Maybe you've upgraded your phones. I know for our kids, they experienced this, that they got mom or dad's hand-me-down. Then they finally, for Christmas or birthday, got a new phone. And then my son, he was the one that would always save up to get the newest phone. I don't know about you, but you probably did some upgraded. We do it too as adults, don't we? We start in the little starter house, and then we've got some equity, and we get a bigger house, and we start 
on the bottom in our jobs and we upgrade maybe some more education and we upgrade in, in our salary. We start, I don't know about you, I still have a 32 inch television in my house, but I've also got a 55 inch or a 60 inch, maybe you got a 70. I saw in Costco the other day an 86 inch TV. Now, if anybody wants to bless me with an 86 inch TV, uh, I'll take it. I don't know why you would need one that big. We upgrade cars. We upgrade all kinds of things, don't we? There's nothing wrong with upgrading inherently. Okay, there's nothing wrong with it. I've upgraded with stuff, but we've got to ask ourselves sometimes, why? What's our motivation? What's it doing to our hearts when we upgrade? Is it even really necessary? Have we got so focused on things that it's all about getting and attaining did you know the average home in America in 1950 was 1,000 square feet? In 1970, it was 1,500 square feet. In 2000, it was 2,200 square feet. In the last 30 years, the family size has gone down 25%, but the house size has gone up 50%. We upgrade. We build bigger barns. It's what we do. And there's nothing wrong with it, like I said, at least initially, until it starts to change our hearts like it did for this man in the story. Our hearts can easily change from being focused on Christ, like the way we start Christmas, to being hearts of greed and only accumulating for ourselves in the next upgrade or the next big thing. And you know why that happens? I think that happens for a lot of us because we start comparing. We act like owners when we're always comparing, comparing ourselves to others. We compare our clothing, we compare our shoes, we compare our looks, we compare our technology, we compare vacations. Where do we do it? A lot of times right here on social media, flipping through, maybe looking on social media and seeing where somebody went on vacation or what their Christmas was like. Good intentions, but before you know it, we're comparing. And I don't know about you, but we very seldom compare down we usually compare up. Pride starts to creep in when we compare and we start to say things like, I just want what's mine. I just want what's fair. I want what is owed to me. I want what I deserve. Let's look back at our story. In verse 19, the man in the story says, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample good laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. See, this man had focused on everything that he had. He be, his money became a functional savior. He was leaning on it. The flow of overwhelming amounts had shaped his heart and how he thought and how he looked at everything. And he was no longer a blessing to others, but he was just getting more and more. Did you notice in the earlier verses it said, my crops, my barns, my grain, my goods, instead of God's, just like I said to Becca a few months ago. And this revealed where he was truly putting his trust. Jesus tells us the result in verse 20. He says, but God said to him, fool. That's that, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Now I want to be really clear here. You should not interpret that passage as God is going to kill him for having money. Okay? That's not what God is saying. In fact, God did not reprimand him for having great wealth. He didn't reprimand him even for building barns. He reprimanded him for living for himself and not for the kingdom and for others. See, it's not even really about losing your life, but more about not living the blessed life that God wants for you. Being a good steward is that I'm a steward of everything, like it said in Psalms 24. Everything that God has given me to be able to be a blessing when God wants me to be a blessing to someone else. I believe that God has amazing blessings for us if we will let go and stop being the owners. And I'm learning that myself. So here's what I want us to do. This is the most important part of the message, and yes, we're right here at the end. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to take a few minutes, and I just want us to listen to God and what he has to say to us as we come into this new year. 
For some of you, this may be a brand new concept. You've never thought about the things that you have being God's and that you are a steward and that God wants to bless you if you'll be a blessing to others. For some of you, we need to get in and start thinking about how we budget, okay? Now, God wants us to be budgeters. God wants us to live within our means. And some of us, though, are so tight in thinking about money and we get so focused on how we can earn it and how we can take care of everything and take care of our families We start asking all our families for receipts. We start getting on to them when they go to Seven Brew or Starbucks or getting a Coke at Come and Go, and we just get out of control. And we need to humble ourselves and remember that God's the owner and just be good stewards. And then there's another side of us that sometimes just says, "Ah, God's got this. I don't have to worry about it. But really, if we're honest with ourselves, we're just being financially irresponsible. See, when we're being a good steward, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 8 says that God will generously provide all that you need. And then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. That's what he wants for us. That we'll be a good steward so we can be a blessing to bless others. Now I want everybody to hear this, especially the teenagers in the room. Some of us have upgraded for Christmas. Okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. But I want to challenge you to spend some time listening to God because maybe there's a divine appointment coming in your life where you can give back to someone else and be a blessing to them. Last Christmas, I got shoes too. I, was at, I asked for a pair of shoes. I got some extra Christmas money. I even looked back in my records. I went on Christmas Day. They were having a sale. I bought another pair of shoes for half price. Later, a couple of weeks later in January, I was at a neighborhood market. I was leaving the market, and I saw a guy in a football jersey. I don't even remember what team it was, but I started a conversation. I said something to him about his team either winning or losing or if he thought they were going to win, and, and we started this conversation. And it didn't take me long to figure out this was a divine appointment. This was a man who was in need. So we took care of a th- few things, but one of the things I asked him is, what is your greatest need? And he looked down at his feet, and he said, this is the only pair of shoes I have. They were ratty. They had holes in them. He said, I have to wear these to work. I wear them everywhere. This is all that I have. What did I get for Christmas? Shoes. I asked him, what size are you? My size. Now, I'll be honest. I didn't give him the shoes that I got for Christmas, but I had plenty of good shoes that now I was going to wear new ones and they were still in good shape. In fact, I gave him a pair of Jordans and four or five other pairs of shoes and took him some hoodies and some other stuff just to bless him. Maybe some of you have something that you've upgraded or something in your life, and you just need to ask God, is there somebody out there that needs to be blessed? Is there a divine appointment in my, in my life? I don't know what God is putting on your heart, but I just want us to take a few minutes And just listen to God. And then I'll close us with prayer. Let's close our eyes and just listen to what God has to say to us. Father God, thank you for speaking to us today. I thank you for your word and how it powerfully still speaks today, Lord. May we be stewards as you have called us to be. Help us to let go of being the owners. We don't want to be called fools. We want to honor you with all that you've given us, Lord. So Lord, help us to be the stewards that you want for us to be. Lord, help us to be a blessing to others. Father, I just pray that for many of us in this room that we'll have divine appointments 
in the next few days or weeks and we'll be able to bless others. Father, I thank you for blessing us with your son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth as a baby and lived a perfect, sinless life and then gave his life for us so that we could have eternal life, life with you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for blessing us with your life. May we be a blessing to you in all that we say and do in this coming year. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I want to encourage you, if you need someone to pray for you, I would love to do that at the end of the service. I will be in the decision point. If you're watching online or maybe you just want to do it yourself online or to check in with us through text, uh, please let us know if there's something we can pray about or there's a, de a decision that you need to make. But again, I will be in the decision point after the service. I'd love to hear your story or pray with you. This is also a time where, you know, God gives to us and he asks us to give our first fruits, to give our tithes back to him. So this is a time in our service where you can give back to God. You can see on the screen how you can give online through text or online. Also, if you're in the room, you can give at the black boxes at either one of the exits to the Lord this week. I'm so thankful for how our church is a giving church and how we um, love others so well. And I'm proud of you guys for that. Father, be with us this coming year and help us to continue to be a giving church. Amen. May we turn our eyes and our thoughts towards communion at this time.